I remember like watching my kids grow up and again, like, yes, part of their personality has stayed the same, but also in different phases to their life, they've gone through these dramatically different types of behaviors. And, you know, my daughter basically saying, you know, basically one, one kid saying, oh, I want the bigger piece. The other one saying, oh, everything must be exactly equal. And the third one saying, I'm okay. Yeah. You, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have the smaller part. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Even in the early days, in the early yeah. days of development. Yeah. It, it's just extraordinary to sort of see these dramatically different, like, I mean, my wife and I, uh, you know, are, are very different from each other, but we also have you know, 6 million variants, 6 million loci each, if you wish, if you just look at common variants, we also have a bunch of rare variants that are inherited in more Mendelian fashion. And now you have, you know, an infinite number of possibilities for each of the kids. So basically it's two to the 6 million just from the common variants. And then if you like layer in the, the rare variants. So let me talk a little bit about common variants and rare variants. So if you look at just common variants, mm -hmm. they're generally weak effect, because selection selects against strong effect variants. So if something like has a big risk for schizophrenia, it won't rise to high frequency. So the ones that are common are by definition, by selection, only the ones that had relatively weak effect. And if all of the variants associated with personality, with cognition and all aspects of human behavior were weak effect variants, then kids would basically be just averages of their parents if it was like thousands of loci, just by law, law of large numbers, the average of two large numbers would be, you know, very robustly close to that middle. But what we see is that kids are dramatically different from each other. So that basically means that in the context of that common variation, you basically have rare variants that are inherited in a more Mendelian fashion that basically then sort of govern likely many different aspects of human behavior, human biology and human psychology. And that's, again, if, like if you look at sort of a person with schizophrenia, their identical twin has only 50% chance of actually being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So that basically means there's probably developmental uh, exposures, environmental exposures, trauma, all kinds of other aspects that can shape that. And if you look at siblings, for the common variants, it kind of drops off exponentially, as you would expect, with you know, sharing 50% of your genome, 25% of your genome, you know, 12.5% of your genome, et cetera, with more and more distant cousins. But the fact that siblings can differ so much in their personalities that we observe every day, it can't all be nurture. Basically, you know, we, we've, like, again, as parents, we, we spend enormous amount of energy trying to fix, quote unquote, the nurture part, trying to, you know, get them to share, get them to be kind, get them to be open, get them to trust each other, like, you know, like overcome the prisoner's dilemma uh, of, you know, if, if everyone fends for themselves, we're all going to live in a horrible place. But if we're a little more altruistic, then we're all going to be in a better place. And I think it's not like we treat our kids differently, but but they're they're just born differently. So in a way, as a geneticist, I have to admit that there's only so much I can do with nurture that nature definitely plays a big component. The the selection of variants we have, the common variants and the rare variants. What uh, what can we say about the landscape of possibility they create? If you could just linger on that. So the the selection of rare variants is, is divine how? How do we get the ones that we get? Is, is it just laden in that giant evolutionary baggage? So I'm going to talk about regression. Why do we call it regression? Mm -hmm. And the concept of regression to the mean, the fact that when fighter pilots in a dogfight did amazingly well, they would give them rewards. And then the next time they're in a dogfight, they would do worse. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, the Navy basically realized that, wow, this, or at least interpreted that as, wow, we're ruining them by praising them. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to perform worse. The statistical interpretation of that is regression of the mean. The fact that you're an extraordinary pilot, you've been trained in an extraordinary fashion, that pushes your mean further and further to extraordinary achievement. And then in some dogfights, you'll just do extraordinarily well. The probability that the next one will be just as good is almost nil because this is the peak of your performance. And just by statistical odds, the next one will be another sample from the same underlying distribution 
which is going to be a little closer to the mean. So regression analysis <laughs> takes its name from this type of realization in the statistical world. Now, if you now take um, humans, you basically have people who have achieved extraordinary achievements. Uh, Einstein, for example, you know, you would call him, for example, the epitome of human intellect. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that all of his children and grandchildren will be extraordinary geniuses? It probably means that they're sampled from the same underlying distribution, but he was probably a rare combination of extremes in addition to these common variants. So you can basically interpret your kid's variation, for example, as, well, of course, they're gonna be some kind of sampled from the average of the parents with some kind of deviation according to the specific combination of rare variants that they have, that they have inherited. So, you know, given all that, the, op, the, you know, the possibilities are endless as to sort of where you should be, but you should always interpret that with, well, it's probably an alignment of nature and nurture. And the nature has both the common variants that are acting kind of like the law of large numbers and the rare variants that are acting more in a Mendelian fashion. And then you layer in the nurture, which again, in everyday action we make, we shape our future environment, but the genetics we inherit are shaping the future environment of not only us, but also our children. So there's this weird nature nurture interplay and self-reinforcement where you're kind of shaping your own environment, but you're also shaping the environment of your kids. And your kids are gonna be born in the context of your environment that you've shaped, but also with a bag of genetic variants that they have inherited. And there's just so much complexity associated with that. When we start blaming something on nature, it might just be nurture. It might just be that, well, yes, they inherited the genes from the parents, but they also you know, were shaped by the same environment. So it's very, very hard to untangle the two. And you should always realize that nature can influence nurture, nurture can influence nature, or at least be correlated with and predictive of, and so on and so forth. So I love thinking about that distribution that you mentioned, and here's where I can uh, be my usual ridiculous self. And uh, I sometimes think about that army of sperm cells, well, however many hundreds of thousands there are, and I kind of think of all the possibilities there, because there's a lot of variation, and one gets to win. Is, is that it's a, not a random one? Is, is it a totally ridiculous way to think about? No, not at all. The... <laughs> so I would say evolutionarily, we are a very slow evolving species. Basically, the generations of humans are a terrible way to do selection. What you need is processes that allow you to do selection in a smaller, tighter loop. Yeah. And part of what, if you look at our immune system, for example, it evolves at a much faster pace than humans evolve because there is actually an evolutionary process that happens within our immune cells. Mm -hmm. As they're dividing, there's basically VDJ recombination that basically creates this extraordinary wealth of antibodies and antigens against the, the environment. And basically all these antibodies are now recognizing all these antigens from the environment and they send signals back that cause these cells that recognize the non-self to multiply. So that basically means that even though viruses evolve at millions of times faster than we are, we can still have a component of ourselves which is environmentally facing, which is sort of evolving at not the same scale, but very rapid pace. Sperm expresses perhaps the most proteins of any cell in the body. And Part of the thought is that this might just be a way to check that the sperm is intact. In other words, if you waited until that human has a liver and starts eating solid food and you know sort of filtrates away, you know, uh, or or kidneys or stomach, etc. Basically, if you waited until these mutations you know manifest late, late in life then you would end up not failing fast and you would end up with a lot of failed pregnancies and a lot of later onset, you know, psychiatric illnesses, et cetera. If instead you basically express all of these genes at the sperm level and if they misform, they basically cause the sperm to cripple, then you have at least on the male side the ability to exclude some of those mutations. And on the female side, as the egg develops, 
there's probably a similar uh, process where you could you could sort of weed out eggs that are just not, you know, carrying beneficial mutations, or at least that are carrying highly detrimental mutations. So you can basically think of the evolutionary process in a nested loop, basically, where there's an inner loop where you get many, many more iterations to, to run, and then there's an outer loop that moves at a much slower pace. And going back to uh, the next step of evolution of possibly designing systems that we can use to sort of complement our own biology or to sort of eradicate disease and you name it, or at least mitigate uh, some of the, I don't know, psychiatric illnesses, neurodegenerative disorders, et cetera. You can basically, and also, you know, metabolic, immune, cancer, you name it. Simply engineering these mutations from rational design might be very inefficient. If instead you have an evolutionary loop where you're kind of growing neurons on a dish and you're exploring evolutionary space and you're sort of shaping that one protein to be better adapt at sort of, I don't know, recognizing light or communicating with other neurons, et cetera, you can basically have a smaller evolutionary loop that you can run like thousands of times faster than the speed it would take to evolve humans for another million years. So I think it's important to think about sort of this evolvability as a set of nested structures that allow you to sort of test many more combinations, but in a more fixed setting. Yeah, that's fascinating that so the, the mechanism there is uh, for, for sperm to express proteins to create a testing ground early on uh, so that the the failed designs don't make it. Yeah, I mean, in design of engineering systems, fail fast is one of the principles you learn. Yeah. Like basically you assert something. Why do you assert that? Because if that something ain't right, you better crash now than sort of let it crash at an unexpected time. And in a way you can think of it as like 20,000 assert functions, assert protein can fold, assert protein can fold. Yeah. And if any of them fail, that sperm is gone. Well, I just like the fact that I'm the winning sperm. I have the result <laughs> of the, the winner, winning, hashtag winning. My, my wife always plays me this French song that actually sings about that. It's like, you know, remember in life, we were all the first one time. <laughs> <laughs> so at least once at we least won. one time you were the first 